Book Six, Canto Two of the Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Canto Two. Calidor sees young Tristram slay a proud, discourteous knight. He makes him squire, and of him learns his state and present plight. What virtue is so fitting for a knight, or for a lady whom a knight should love, as courtesy, to bear themselves aright to all of each degree as doth behoove? For whether they be placed high above or low beneath, yet ought they well to know their good that none them rightly may reprove of rudeness for not yielding what they owe great skill it is such duties kindly to bestow thereto great help dame nature's self doth lend for some so goodly gracious are by kind that every action doth them much commend and in the eyes of men great liking find which others that have greater skill in mind though they enforce themselves cannot attain for every thing to which one is inclined doth best become, and greatest grace doth gain. Yet praise likewise deserve good thews, enforced with pain. That well in courteous Calidor appears, whose every deed and word that he did say was like enchantment, that through both the ears and both the eyes did steal the heart away. He now again is on his former way to follow his first quest, when as he spied a tall young man from thence not far away fighting on foot, as well he him descried against an armed knight that did on horseback ride, and then beside a lady fair he saw standing alone on foot in foul array, to whom himself he hastily did draw to weet the cause of so uncomely fray, and to depart them, if so be he may. But ere he came in place, that youth had killed that armed knight, that low on ground he lay, which when he saw his heart was inly chilled with great amazement, and his thought with wonder filled. Him steadfastly he marked, and saw to be a goodly youth of amiable grace, yet but a tender slip, that scarce did see yet seventeen years, but tall and fair a face, that sure he deemed him born of noble race. All in a woodman's jacket he was clad of Lincoln green, belayed with silver lace, and on his head and hood with aglets spread, and by his side his hunter's horn he hanging had. Buskins he wore of costliest cordwain, pinked upon gold, and paled part per part, as then the guise was for each gentle swain. In his right hand he held a trembling dart, whose fellow he before had sent apart, and in his left he held a sharp boar-spear, with which he wont to launch the salvage heart of many a lion, and of many a bear, that first unto his hand in chase did happen near. Whom Calidore, while well having viewed, at length bespake, What means this gentle swain? Why hath thy hand too bold itself imbrued in blood of night, the which by thee is slain, by thee no knight, which arms impuneth plain? Certes, said he, loath were I to have broken the law of arms, yet break it should again rather than let myself of white be stroken, so long as these two arms were able to be broken. For not I him, as this his lady here may witness well, did offer first to wrong, as surely thus unarmed I likely were, but he me first, through pride and puissance strong assailed, not knowing what to arms doth long. Her dee great blame, then said Sir Calidore, for armed knight, a white unarmed to wrong. But then a reed, thou gentle child, wherefore betwixt you two began this strife and stern uproar? That shall I sooth, said he, to you declare. I, whose unriper years are yet unfit for thing of weight, or work of greater care, do spend my days and bend my careless wit to salvage chase, where I thereon may hit in all this forest and wild woody rain where, as this day I was enranging it, I chanced to meet this knight, who there lies slain, together with this lady, passing on the plain. The knight, as ye did see, on horseback was, and this his lady, that him ill became, on her fair feet by his horse side did pass through thick and thin, unfit for any dame, yet not content, more to increase his shame, when so she lagged, as she needs mote do, he with his spear, that was to him great blame, would thump her forward and enforce to go, weeping to him in vain, and making piteous woe. 
which when I saw as they me passed by, much was I moved in indignant mind, and gan to blame him for such cruelty towards a lady, whom with usage kind he rather should have taken up behind. Wherewith he wroth, and full of proud disdain, took in foul scorn, that I such fault did find, and me, in lieu thereof, reviled again, threatening to chastise me, as doth the child pertain. Which I, no less disdaining, back returned his scornful taunts unto his teeth again, that he straightway with haughtier collar burned, and with his spear struck me one stroke or twain, which I enforced to bear, though to my pain, cast to requite, and with a slender dart, fellow of this I bear, thrown not in vain, struck him as seemeth underneath the heart, that through the wound his spirit shortly did depart. Much did Sir Calidore admire this speech, tempered so well, but more admired the stroke that through the males had made so strong a breach into his heart, and had so sternly wroke his wrath on him that first occasion broke yet rested not, but further gan inquire of that same lady, whether what he spoke were soothly so, and that the unrighteous ire of her own knight had given him his own due hire. Of all which, when as she could not deny, but cleared that stripling of the imputed blame, said then Sir Calidore, neither will I him charge with guilt, but rather do quite claim, for what he spake, for you he spake it, dame, and what he did, he did himself to save, against both which that night wrought nightless shame, for knights and all men this by nature have, towards all women kind them kindly to behave. But sith that he is gone irrevocable, please it you, lady, to us to read what cause could make him so dishonorable, to drive you so on foot, unfit to tread, and lackey by him, gainst all womanhead. Certes, Sir Knight, said she, full loath I were to raise a living blame against the dead, but since it me concerns myself to clear, I will the truth discover as it chanced while e'er. This day, as he and I together rode upon our way to which we were in bent, we chanced to come forby a covered glade within a wood, whereas a lady gent sate with a knight in joyous jolliment of their frank loves, free from all jealous spies. Fair was the lady, sure, that mote content in heart, not carried with too curious eyes, and under him did shew all lovely courtesies. Whom when my knight did see so lovely fair, he inly gan her lover to envy, and wish that he part of his spoil might share. Whereto, when, as my presence he did spy to be a let, he bade me by and by for to alight, but when as I was loath my love's own part to leave so suddenly, he with strong hand down from his steed me throth, and with presumptuous power against that knight straight goth. Unarmed all was the knight, as then more meet for lady's service and for love's delight than fearing any foeman there to meet, whereof he taking odds straight bids him dight himself to yield his love, or else to fight whereat the other starting up dismayed, yet boldly answered as he rightly might, to leave his love he should be ill appaid, in which he had good right against all that it gainsaid. Yet since he was not presently in plight her to defend, or his to justify, he him requested, as he was a knight, to lend him day his better right to try, or stay till he his arms, which were thereby, might lightly fetch. But he was fierce and hot, ne time would give nor any terms aby, but at him flew, and with his spear him smot, from which to think to save himself it booted not. Meanwhile his lady, which this outrage saw, whilst they together for the quarry strove, into the cover did herself withdraw, and closely hid herself within the grove. My knight hers soon as seems to danger drove, and left sore wounded. But when her he missed, he walks half mad, and in that rage gan rove and range through all the wood where so he wist she hidden was, and sought her so long as him list. But when as her he by no means could find, after long search and chaff, he turned back unto the place where me he left behind. There gan he me to curse and ban for lack of that fair booty, and with bitter rack to wreak on me the guilt of his own wrong of all which I yet glad to bear the pack strove to appease him, and persuaded long. But still his passion grew more violent and strong. Then, as it were, to avenge his wrath on me, when forward we should fare, he flat refused to take me up, 
as this young man did see upon his steed for no just cause accused but forced to trot on foot and foul misused punching me with the butt end of his spear in vain complaining to be so abused for he regarded neither plaint nor tear but more enforced my pain the more my plaints to hear so passed we till this young man us met and being moved with pity of my plight spake as was meet for ease of my regret whereof befell what now is in your sight now sure then said sir calidore and right meseems that him befell by his own fault who ever thinks through confidence of might or through support of countenance proud and halt to wrong the weaker oft falls in his own assault then turning back unto that gentle boy which had himself so stoutly well acquit seeing his face so lovely stern and coy and hearing the answers of his pregnant wit he praised it much and much admired it that sure he weaned him born of noble blood with whom those graces did so goodly fit and when he long had him beholding stood he burst into these words as to him seemed good fair gentle swain and yet as stout as fair that in these woods amongst the nymphs dost one which daily may to thy sweet looks repair as they are wont unto latona's son after his chase on woody synthus done well may i certes such an one thee read as by thy worth thou worthily hast won or surely born of some heroic seed that in thy face appears and gracious goodlihead but should it not displease thee it to tell unless thou in these woods thyself conceal for love amongst the woody gods to dwell i would thyself require thee to reveal for dear affection and unfeigned zeal which to thy noble personage i bear and wish thee grow in worship and great weal for since the day that arms i first did rear i never saw in any greater hope appear to whom then thus the noble youth may be sir knight that by discovering my estate harm may arise unweeting unto me natheless sith ye so courteous seemed late to you i will not fear it to relate then wot ye that i am a briton born son of a king however thorough fate or fortune i my country have forlorn and lost the crown which should my head by right adorn and tristram is my name the only heir of good king meliagrus which did reign in cornwall till that he through lives despair untimely died before i did attain ripe years of reason my right to maintain after whose death his brother seeing me an infant weak a kingdom to sustain upon him took the royal high degree and sent me where him list instructed for to be the widow queen my mother which then hight fair emmeline conceiving then great fear of my frail safety resting in the might of him that did the kingly sceptre bear whose jealous dread enduring not appear is wont to cut off all that doubt may breed thought best a way me to remove somewhere into some foreign land where as no need of dreaded danger might his doubtful humour feed so taking counsel of a wise man read she was by him advised to send me quite out of the country wherein i was bred the which the fertile lioness is hight into the land of fairy where no wight should weet of me nor work me any wrong to whose wise reed she hearkening sent me straight into this land where i have woned thus long since i was ten years old now grown to stature strong all which my days i have not lewdly spent nor spilt the blossom of my tender years in idleness but as was convenient have trained been with many noble fears in gentle thews and such like seemly leers amongst which my most delight hath always been to hunt the savage chase amongst my peers of all that rangeth in the forest green of which none is to me unknown that ever was seen nay is there hawk which mantleth her on perch whether high towering or a coasting low but i the measure of her flight do search and all her prey and all her diet know such be our joys which in these forests grow only the use of arms which most i joy and fitteth most for noble swain to know i have not tasted yet yet past a boy and being now high time these strong joints to employ therefore good sir 
sith now occasion fit doth fall whose like hereafter seldom may let me this crave unworthy though of it that ye will make me squire without delay that from henceforth in battleless array i may bear arms and learn to use them right the rather since that fortune hath this day given me the spoil of this dead knight these goodly gilden arms which i have won in fight all which when well sir calidore had heard him much more now than erst again admire for the rare hope which in his years appeared and thus replied fair child the high desire to love of arms which in you doth aspire i may not certes without blame deny but rather wish that some more noble hire though none more noble than his chivalry i had you to reward with greater dignity there him he caused to kneel and made to swear faith to his knight and truth to ladies all and never to be recreant for fear of peril or of aught that might befall so he him dubbed and his squire did call full glad and joyous then young tristram grew like as a flower whose silken leave is small long shut up in the bud from heaven's view at length breaks forth and broad displays his smiling hue thus when they long had treated to and fro and calidore betook him to depart child tristram prayed that he with him might go on his adventure vowing not to start but wait on him in every place and part whereat sir calidore did much delight and greatly joyed at his so noble heart in hope he sure would prove a doughty knight yet for the time this answer he to him behight glad would i surely be thou courteous squire to have thy presence in my present quest that mote thy kindled courage set on fire and flame forth honour in thy noble breast but i am bound by vow which i professed to my dread sovereign when i it essayed that in achievement of her high behest i should no creature join unto mine aid for thee i may not grant that ye so greatly prayed but since this lady is all desolate and needeth safeguard now upon her way ye may do well in this her needful state to succour her from danger of dismay that thankful guerdon may do you repay the noble imp of such new service fain it gladly did accept as he did say so taking courteous leave they parted twain and calidore forth passed to his former pain but tristram then despoiling that dead knight of all those goodly implements of praise long fed his greedy eyes with the fair sight of the bright metal shining like sun rays handling and turning them a thousand ways and after having them upon him dight he took that lady and her up did raise upon the steed of her own late dead knight so with her marched forth as she did him behight there to their fortune leave with him awhile and turn we back to good sir calidore who ere he thence had travelled many a mile came to the place where as ye heard afore this knight whom tristram slew had wounded sore another knight in his dispiteous pride there he that night found lying on the floor with many wounds full perilous and wide that all his garments and the grass in vermil died and there beside him sate upon the ground his woeful lady piteously complaining with loud laments that most unlucky stound and her sad self with careful hand constraining to wipe his wounds and ease their bitter paining which sorry sight when calidore did view with heavy eyne from tears uneath refraining his mighty heart their mournful case gan rue and for their better comfort to them nigher drew then speaking to the lady thus he said ye doleful dame let not your grief impeach to tell what cruel hand hath thus arrayed this knight unarmed with so unknightly breach of arms that if i yet him nigh may reach i may avenge him of so foul despite the lady hearing his so courteous speech gan rear her eyes as to the cheerful light and from her sorry heart few heavy words forth sight in which she showed how that discourteous knight whom tristram slew them in that shadow found joying together in unblamed delight and him unarmed as now he lay on ground charged with his spear and mortally did wound without an cause but only her to reave from him to whom she was for ever bound 
yet when she fled into that covert grieve he her not finding both them thus nigh dead did leave when calidore this rueful story had well understood he gan of her demand what manner white he was and how he clad which had this outrage wrought with wicked hand she then like as she best could understand him thus described to be of stature large clad all in gilded arms with azure band quartered athwart and bearing in his targe a lady on rough waves rode in a summer barge then gan sir calidore to guess straightway by many signs which he described had that this was he whom tristram erst did slay and to her said dame be no longer sad for he that hath your knight so ill bestead is now himself in much more wretched plight these eyes him saw upon the cold earth spread the meed of his desert for that despite which to yourself he wrought and to your loved knight therefore fair lady lay aside this grief which ye have gathered to your gentle heart for that displeasure and think what relief were best devised for this your lover's smart and how ye may him hence and to what part convey to be recured she thanked him dear both for that news he did to her impart and for the courteous care which he did bear both to her love and to herself in that sad drear yet could she not devise by any wit how thence she might convey him to some place for him to trouble she had thought unfit that was a stranger to her wretched case and him to bear she thought it thing too base which when as he perceived he thus bespake fair lady let it not you seem disgraced to bear this burden on your dainty back myself will bear a part co-portion of your pack so off he did his shield and downward laid upon the ground like to an hollow beer and pouring balm which he had long purveyed into his wounds him up thereon did rear and twixt them both with parted pains did bear twixt life and death not knowing what was done thence they him carried to a castle near in which a worthy ancient knight did one where what ensued shall in next canto be begun end of canto two recording by thomas copeland